If you happen to click on this video before looking at the length, don't worry, I will have all the chapter breaks below in the description. Do you know what you get when you combine the hottest city in America with one of the most groundbreaking video games of 2007? It's pretty simple. You get yourself a Phoenix portal. And that's what we're going to get here. But before that, a memoriam. You, you sort of knew him. You might have come to love him. He, he was the mutation. He was the remutation. He did a lot of things not great. He had too much flex. He couldn't fit over the bridges. He couldn't perform simple crawler tasks. And at the end of the upcoming 20 seconds, we'll just have a moment of silence right here. May we remember him well. His parts will go on to good homes. And with that, let's get straight into the build. This is a long one. I hope you enjoy. And sad or otherwise, that's, that's the end of mutation or remutation because as a thought experiment, there was something. And it was kind of neat, but as crawlers go, it did not excel. And sometimes things have got to go to make room for other things. Probably already given it away by the title. But here's what we'll be replacing it with. My first attempt at a big boy kit. Vanquish VS410 Phoenix. So we're gonna get it out of the box, and we're gonna do a little video, and we're gonna do a little time lapse, and we're gonna get it put together. And hopefully, I have the electronics to fit it. I don't know. I know they're real finicky about motor length, but I've got servos. We've got the two AGFRC for the shift and dig, and we've got the direct off battery AGFR, AGFRC 12 volt, which is one of my favorites. So let's get it open. Let's see how she looks. I beg forgiveness for the overall noisiness. This is a metal building. It's generally just loud. Bag J, those the tires. Half cab in the interior. Some fenders, where the camera is. Transmissions in bag D. Body parts in bag I. Shocks in bag E. One of the portal axles in bag A. Chassis bits in bag C. Battery tray, straps, decorative stuff in bag H. Frame rails. There we go. Drive shafts. Links. The other axle in bag B, and the manual, and a couple tools. Let's get this box out of the way. I won't get any of this stuff for a little while. There, D. Open. 
I will try to get some better close-ups of what's coming out of the bags. Try not to attack this with the usual fervor that I do. Maybe slow it down a little bit. And uh, hoping not to have to re-record all this audio later because, as I said, it's noisy in here. But uh, we'll see how it goes. So I'm going to go ahead and get this underway. And this is just one man's opinion. But I feel like YouTube is bereft with build videos. And if you've ever built a crawler, they're all sort of basically the same. So I might, might slow down and get a little more into detail when we get up to bag D with that crazy gear filled transmission. But we've all built an axle and we've all built shocks and we've all meticulously screwed links together. So for that part, this is just gonna time lapse it out. We'll crush it down to just a few seconds. I'll slow it down here and there uh, for anything I find interesting. But other than that, this is mostly gonna be a time lapse. We're gonna get through this thing and uh, get it together and get it out into the canyon and see how she does. Got bag A open and ready to go. I have to say so far, the promises of Vanquish quality do not disappoint. The manual is typical quality stuff like what we'd see from Traxxas or Axial. And if any point during this video you hear a repetitive clicking in the background, that's just these guys. I'm popping in during the fast stuff just to say uh, if this isn't your cup of tea, don't worry. I don't think any of the time-lapse sections are longer than about 20 seconds because uh, I seem to have a lot to say about this kit. A quick note here, while we're at this point, this bearing here, where the shaft, the drive shaft comes through, there's no, there's no step on the drive shaft. It's just smooth. And there's no outer stop, well, I guess inner stop on the bearing. So when you go to push the stub axle in, the bearing just falls out. There's no, there's nothing to set where this gear stops. So if the knuckle isn't screwed into the axle, the whole thing can fall out this way or the axle and all the gear can fall out the other way. So I found kind of the easiest way is to insert the stub into the housing and then bolt this together over it to kind of hold it in place. I didn't anticipate that part, but it, it goes together pretty smoothly other than that. With that front axle together, I can pretty confidently say this is the smoothest axle I've ever put together. Like, there's no resistance at all. It's like, it's like butter. So if the rest of the kit holds up to that level, we're in for something good. So with that out of the way, on to bag B, which is the pretty much the same thing, only with maybe four less parts. It's essentially the same thing. That finishes the axles, which went together as well as could conceivably be imagined. The rear axle, if anything, is perhaps even smoother than the, fir the front, having no universals in it. These are extremely well made. All we have left over are three little wee baby five millimeter shims, which I can only assume, seeing as they're mentioned at no point in the manual uh, that they are to shim the output for the pinions, but they don't need it. Uh, there's a slight bit of inward movement, which I believe will be stopped when the drive shafts are attached, 
Uh, I can't see any need for them internally unless they are intended to go between the bearing and the drive shaft, and I find out about that later. But that's how it sits for now. I'll be moving on to bag C, doing some of the frame bits. Looks like the is that the steering servo. Looks like the steering servo is already going to be going on. And the rest of the stuff. Looks like this guy's gonna go together pretty quickly, at least until we get to that transmission bag, which is immense. That's just gearbox in there. But that's where I am for the moment, and we'll be back on time lapse shortly. Now, ready? Done with the Costco lunch break. And uh, time to move on to back seat. So, back to the time lapse. So the first half of bag C, pretty smooth sailing. They do use three different lengths of bolt on getting everything onto the rails. These are sixes, uh, these are tens, and over here we've got an eight. I think that one's an eight. So getting an eight and a six confused is pretty easy. And getting these two parts to sandwich, I mean, it's not the easiest thing, but once they go in, they're in. Uh, centering the servo obviously later, hopefully it won't be too difficult to get that horn centered but half of it, it threw together pretty well. Unlike some other kits, they don't try to jam too much into one page. It's really, it's pretty clear which holes take which screws. I uh, just gotta pay close attention to which way the shock towers go on because man, have I gotten those wrong before. Anyhow, uh, we'll finish up bag C and then I think the step after that is the gearbox so that might take some time and um, I'm sure I'll have some more to say about that. So back to the time lapse. As the right side is a near mirror of the left, the difference is being just two screws here on this slider, whereas there's three on this side and uh, obviously no pan hard mount on this side but I mean the instructions are a little unclear because instead of turning the whole thing around now we're just going to have you put screws in from the blind side so it's much easier to just compare the one side to the other and just use the same screw that you used on the other side except for like I say two bolts there instead of three on the other side and then you've got pretty much a whole chassis built and it is very crisp and clean and everything fits together perfectly. It, it went together wonderfully till this point. And uh, I believe, yep, open bag D. That is, that is gonna be something for sure. So we'll time lapse, but I'll probably be interrupted now and then. Here, after just getting bag D opened up, D1, and going through the plastic bits, this is a lot of stuff. This is, this is where we've gotten to where it's different from building some other kit. Uh, I tend to free up pretty much everything except the smallest bits from the sprue when I'm going through this. And you might as well just cut them all off because there are tabs on the sprue where they would usually be like, you know, numbered or lettered, not, they're just blank. So it's gonna be about lining the appropriate part up with the spot in the manual to get this going. And this, this is a lot of pieces. This is before we even get into the bag of gears and the bag with all the shafts for the dig and then the fastener bag. This is a lot of bits. I've done the SCX-10-3 gearbox and this is more pieces than that. 
So it should be a blast. I mean, it should go together pretty much perfectly if it's anything like how it's come on so far. So here's hoping and back to that time lapse. No surprises here, as Vanquish pretty much explicitly states, fits most 540 size motors. Uh, I had an intention of installing a Fusion. The Fusion pulled out of mutation, but it is a 540 motor that is 550 long because it's got a speed control in there as well. So it looks like, as with other vehicles that I've tried to fit it in, it's about seven millimeters too long to fit. So I guess what's gonna have to happen is some jockeying. I think I will take this motor and put it in my Ecto, take the motor out of the Ecto, put it in Blue Sky High, and take the castle set up from Blue Sky High and put it in here because it has the 1900 slate motor in it, which should fit with plenty of room. But that's gonna be a whole bunch of electronics jockeying that doesn't need to be part of this. So that will be done off screen. And then the next thing you know, everything will be put together. So with that said, back to our regularly scheduled programming. moving sideways in this story through the magic of editing a uh, little yellow the ecto now on the 1200 kv fusion and blue sky high now on the 1800 kv fusion as he had a 1900 in here before we needed something shorter so if you'd had any uh questions about ever owning a hobby wing fusion and I guess the only drawback being that they come in pretty low KVs and are limited 2S or 3S. Uh, this is the 1800 KV motor. And if you want to talk about startup smoothness, I mean, you'd think I was turning the wheels with my hand. I mean, you can get, let's see how slow I can get it to go. It's about as slow as we can go. with a 19 tooth Robinson pinion. It is as close to just dead silent. That noise is mostly the portals. There's almost no noise out of the gearbox itself. So yeah, there's just an aside in between the building of the Phoenix here. And uh, we're gonna uh, get back to that. Censored castle will provisionally fit here clocked to about the two o'clock position. But this is without any of the other motor plastics in place. And I must say that trying to get a gear mesh even just loosely set when the top shaft can do this, yeah, that's impossible. So hopefully, as I get on in assembling this, I will have the opportunity to reset that mesh without having to completely disassemble stuff. But uh, as of now, it's pretty wild. So let's hope that these clear all of that. Anyway, back at it. first time with one of these I was unaware that it's it's basically building the motor into the transmission I mean you can get it out maybe uh, if your motor has a particularly long shaft on the outside I don't know if you can get it out I mean it's it's really in there the the scale detail of it is pretty amazing and much like the axles so smooth. The 
the machining on the gears is just above above excellent. No one else is doing machining of this quality. So, so far so good. I can't wait to get these painted up and get that interior cut to fit those neat little shifters. Um, it's great so far. Fitting the motor was a little bit of a trick. And uh, now we get to the second half of Vag D, which just looks like it's gonna start to get crazy on this one. And uh, yeah, that should be fun. Anyway, we're back at it. Not ashamed to admit, I got to the first spot where I'm like, huh? So we get up here, bag D, install bearings and bearing plate, install lockout. Okay, there's the lockout, there's the box, there's the bearing plate. But where does that guy go? Like, he's got two little holes in him but I don't know what those holes go to. Does he install down, maybe he installs down there? It's not super clear. They don't really show where he goes. Oh, he is threaded. Okay, so maybe that step two down there, see, that is not exceptionally clear. I feel like I have a, a decent spatial awareness. I'm pretty good at grasping stuff like this, but that really slowed me down right there. Where does that go? Because we're getting in the, I mean, that's, that's crazy right there. Anyhow, back at it. I just had to take a mental step back and that's how that goes. You gotta get those bearings in there. And the little bearing holder doesn't want to hold the bearings, so they keep falling out. So I can't turn this over to show the screws going into the what they call a lockout because all the bearings will fall out. And then we've got the, the rest of the gears installed. And then there's this one E-clip left. And you see the slot there for the E-clip. And uh, at no point do they say, hey, put on that E-clip. And then, oh, there it is. Like, it's not there, and then it's there. So that just appears out of nowhere. And then two 12s and a 20, eh, it, it's getting a little finicky. Up till this point, it hasn't been very finicky, but some of this stuff is not explicitly intuitive, I guess, unless you've done this before. And I haven't even gotten to, like, installing the levers and stuff yet, so... It's, uh, it's starting to slow down a little bit. As it turns out, I had one of the shafts installed improperly and one of the shims in the wrong place. And I could not get this thing to go together. I had to go back a couple pages and look through it again because Obviously, this isn't your usual transfer case stuff. There's a lot more going on here, and there's still a whole bunch of pieces. But, as with the axles and everything else, oh, that's hooked up to a motor. It is so smooth. It's frighteningly smooth. And everything goes together perfectly when you do it correctly. So, I mean, I guess... Back to that time lapse and I'll check in again once I've got those little lever friends installed and we'll see how it goes from there. So that finishes the gearbox and the instruction sheet would leave you terrified 
Uh, if you didn't know, I mean, I guess if you didn't sort of guess what was going on, because there's so many pieces left over, but these are all the pieces if you don't want the fancy stuff. If you don't want selectable overdrive and dig, it just has little omission panels. There's OD and dig. And you can just set them with the set screws. I guess if certain competition classes don't allow it on the fly and has a complete motor end, actually to eliminate the whole thing entirely, it looks like. You can just set it to one of the OD positions and then be done. There's also an adapter, slipper eliminator is included. So you can run whatever spur you want. There's the pin because you wouldn't need the brass. It's just a filler to fill a little hole. And then that's the, the cover if you don't want the neat gear shifter. There's also, when I first saw that pin, I was like, oh dear God, am I gonna have to take the whole thing apart? No, that's, that's for that fella if you decide to run that. And there's the locking piece that I couldn't figure out. So anyhow, that's done. Moving on to bag E, which is shocks, which I consider phenomenally boring. It's something that just has to be done though. So I'll get the gearbox screwed down into the, oh look, look, magically appearing drive shafts. So I guess I won't be screwing the gearbox down to the skid just yet because I haven't even gotten to the bag with those in it yet. So yeah, there are definitely some manual omissions. Overall, it's pretty good. But uh, some stuff, they just, parts just appear as if out of nowhere. Anywho, onto the shocks. Just jumping in for a moment to lodge a formal complaint against RC parts manufacturers. I have what are known in the industry as banana hands. They're very large, um, something for scale. Here's a pair of scissors. Uh, they look like tiny little toy scissors. Uh, so when I am tasked with fitting that E-clip, I, I lost two of them almost immediately. Luckily, I have bags of these things because I anticipate this sort of behavior for myself. Uh, another quick note, uh, shout out to Vankish for the, the, the bottom cups with the snap rings being pre-installed so that I don't have to cram those in there. But also be aware, they're not cap retained, they are retained with snap rings. So if you don't have snap ring pliers, and if you don't have a pair of snap ring pliers that are very, very small, I have a pair that I've ground down for fitting and stuff like this. If you don't have that, disassembling these to replace any rings, and you, you don't get any extras, you do get these, look at the size of that. I don't know what those are, but they are microscopic. Uh, you don't have any method to replace these. And I mean, on crawlers, it, it's not a critical thing. You're not gonna be blowing out shock O-rings on a daily basis, like with something that say, you know, jumps 40 feet through the air. But just to be aware, and look at these normal looking hollow balls, uh, which is nice after the shoulderless, odd sized ones that I've been dealing with on other vehicles. So this is a nice change of pace. And uh, back to the slog of building shocks. Another quick shock interruption. The height adjustment collars are thankfully not really a critical part on crawlers. We tend to run the shocks pretty much all the way down because these are so tight that with banana hand strength, I, I cannot thread them on. I can get them on that far. And the threads are fine enough that this one kind of went on a little longest and now I can't get it off and I'm afraid of breaking it. So that's just gonna stay on there like that and we're gonna hope for the best on that one. These are unbelievably tight. 
they're like a millimeter too small but and uh what we have here is shock oil looks like maybe 30 35 weight something like that but whatever it is they're not saying we're gonna go with it um i i haven't really found a shock oil that i've disliked in a crawler so i mean it'll be fun Now certainly, I, I recognize that these aren't just your ordinary run-of-the-mill kit shocks because, man, are they good. They are really good. They go together so nice, and aside from those collars, which maybe if I had, I don't know, lubed them up a little, they would have slid on a little easier. These shocks are smooth. They are really smooth. They're good looking. Being very simple, I love cl I love clamping bottom cups. Everything about them is just really nice. They're also it's just the same spring right all the way around, which is nice. I'm assuming the ride heights are going to be the same all the way around. I'm not used to working with a shock quite this small. These are 80 millimeter, but everything about them is beautiful. Uh, even in terms of a let's say a kit shock, a non aftermarket shock. These have to be the nicest yet. Traxxas shocks are nice, but but these are really nice. I'm a sucker for bleeder caps. I'm a sucker for locking spring cups. And this has got all of that. They, they went together really nicely with just that little hiccup with the height adjustment collar, which I haven't really had to use on any rig here, so. I mean, I would prefer just a fixed length. And with, I, I kind of miss the day's eclipse because they were quick and easy. And uh, let's see what's coming up next. Um, drive shafts. So that's what's coming up next. Drive shafts are pretty much exactly what you'd find on a TRX-4, the captive CVD, exact same method, except here on the Vanquish, the, they got these little crazy little caps that go on the gearbox end, which I was trying to go through the instructions too fast and was like, these shafts don't fit, but that's just me going too fast. And once again, We've got extra pieces. These are uh, 35 mil for the rear and they are 30 millimeters long on the front, both the input and the output on the CVDs. And then we have like 140 and maybe a 45 or a 50. So I don't know what the options are. I haven't read that far ahead. We have a couple extra end caps. Maybe, ah, uh, got it. Uh, uh, I'm just guessing. I haven't read far enough ahead, but this is, I'm guessing, if you build the gearbox without the dig and overdrive unit, it'll shorten it up, and then you would run that longer drive shaft with the different little bits to make up that difference in the rear end. Because it does not appear that the wheelbase can be lengthened, only perhaps shortened. So there's that. I mean, I'm not that guy that reads all the way through to the end of the manual before I start going. I just get straight into it. So gearbox is done. I can now mount it to the skid. Drive shafts are done. And next up are the links, which nobody likes. So I think I'm gonna take a little time off, which in the magic of video won't seem like any time off at all. talk about the links here just for a moment uh first off props to vanquish for just using one rod end it's the same rod end for every link uh it's easy to differentiate upper and lower links the uppers are reduced the lowers are solid they're really nice quality stainless they threaded together really well and uh 
most notably, like no lengths. Just you, you hold the. I mean, it's impossible to to mess them up because there's no lengths. The pan hard and the drag link are the same exact link as they should be because for optimal geometry, those two should be the same length. So, I mean, those are the front lowers and those are the rear lowers and the, those are the there's the front upper and there's the rear uppers and. It, it's almost as if the simplification of not having those numbers just makes it that much easier. Some nice chrome plated balls I gotta snap in still. But uh, that went together blazingly fast. I, I was initially wary because I really like the links, like the Capra, the axial links with the hole in the middle so you can hold it. You put a wrench through there and hold it. But these spun together real nice and not having to deal with left hand, right hand curved, whatever. Excellent. So really happy with these so far and back to it. So the front links are in and they went in remarkably easily. They use a pivot ball that is a pillow ball that is the correct size for the link end. It's the correct size for the molded parts. So everything just kind of slips together. It's going so quickly that the time lapse, it's gonna take like two seconds to get all the links on there. Uh, nice aluminum pan hard mount. Uh, the screw is fairly easily accessible past here. It's not a straight shot, but you can still get in there. Uh, one typo in here, uh, front upper, front upper. So obviously those are the front lowers, but it's that's not too hard to get past. Um, I, I really like the links. Everything is going together really well. I'm getting the part where it's almost time for the front axle to go on. And everything is going along almost too smoothly. Uh, a person of my negative nature is sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop. And I'm going to get that axle slapped on here and just keep moving on. So the front end is assembled except for attaching the drag link because I got to get the servo horn on there and I have to get it powered up to get everything centered. I didn't put the cover on and as you can see the cover cannot go in to get that cover on or off, you have to take the transmission off. So in most of my rigs, I don't run the gear cover anyway. So I don't know if that will be an issue. Uh, I need to find a servo horn that's going to fit because they recommend 20 millimeter and I have a whole box of 25 millimeter. So we'll see how that goes. If a 25 will fit, great. I have plenty of them. But everything has gone together pretty well. As I mentioned before, the, it goes together almost too quickly. This thing is gonna sit very low. Links are pretty much level. Shocks almost bottomed out. Very smooth, as one would expect. A lot of caster in that front end. It, uh, it's going together as well as could possibly be expected. My time-lapse camera has decided to eat all of its extra batteries and will not charge from a wall charger. So I might have another maybe two minutes of time lapse left before that one's done. And then I guess I'll just switch to the the alternate camera. I'll try to find a position for it where it looks okay and, and go from there. Um, rear axle should be in within a minute or two. Got the rear axle installed. That brings me to the end of bag G. That's under bag H, which is all the chassis plastics, fenders, electronics mounts, and whatnot. So here we have the, the chassis. And uh, it is it is buttery smooth. Look at that. Everything went together pretty easily. They only use, I think, 
two different lengths of fasteners for all the link mounts. So that flew together. The batteries on everything are starting to get low. So I think I'm gonna take a break while everything's on the charger, which you won't know but through the magic of editing. But uh, so far, so good. It is looking most excellent. Uh, definitely not an option for people who are looking to build some kind of lightweight rig because as that sits right there, this is already noticeably heavier than, say, an Ecto or a CFXW. Like, it's stout. But that weight, that weight looks real low with the motor way down there. And most of the, the gearbox is actually down here. This is just all cosmetic. As you saw, there's just a shaft that runs through there. So the weight in this thing is going to be really low. So it's going to be exciting to put this thing on the scales and see where the center of gravity falls on this thing. I'm thinking it's going to be pretty low, even for a portaled rig. Anywho, I'll be back at it before you know it. Moving to a little bit of a different layout as we get ready to move on to bag H, the chassis plastics. Let's get this off to the side here. Move on to this open. Quite a few bags inside of bags. We'll say right off the bat that if there's one thing I'm not particularly enamored with, it's this. This is a full blown 2S, 3S, full size hard case battery tray, which I guess some people run, but I run these, so I'm going to have to fabricate some sort of means to affix the battery there. I mean, I guess it will help with weight distribution one way or the other. And as I could tell from the first images I saw of this, there's, there's no way around it. That's the mount for the dig servo. So you, you end up with this. There's, there's no ability to change that to something else. And of course, standard strap locations and my batteries will fit in between that. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll see how that goes. So we're gonna shift back to the speed mode. I'll get all these pieces separated from the sprues and uh, start getting this put together. I've gotten most of the decorative plastics on, bumpers are installed, fenders are installed. Uh, I'm at the point now where they want me to put in the radiator, but I think I'm gonna paint the radiator silver. I think that'll look nicer in silver. Uh, so I'm not gonna mount the fans yet until that's painted. Uh, I'm gonna skip ahead past that. Uh, fenders went on really well, side pieces, everything fit perfectly as I would expect it to. Nice slidey bumpers there. Fair lead hole for the for a servo winch, which I will not be using. But uh, everything is going together really well. I'm almost to the point where it's going to be time to get the receiver mounted up and start calibrating the radio for it, which is going to be a blast. I'm using a an older Airtronics MT4 
four channel and there's so many programming options in that radio that it's really, it's mentally exhausting setting that radio up, but I think it's a perfect fit for what this rig is gonna need. So that's, that's the radio I'm going with. It'll be nice to have a non-floppy front end. So I'll move on and see what goes on next. That came on much faster than I thought. I have all three servos ready to be mounted down, but I can't put any horns on until I get them centered. So I guess it's gonna be time to get a loose mock-up of the radio gear in place. And in order to do that, I have to solder onto this guy, I think. I might just use the, the balance plug adapter for now. I usually like to have a hard line soldered in uh, so that I can get the steering servo centered and the horn mounted for that and then get the, the dig and the overdrive servo centered and their horns hooked up. And uh, it's, it's gonna slow down a bit. So this could be a good while of time lapse. I'll pop back in if I have any comments or concerns as I'm moving, but uh, so long as the servo horns that I have fit, they want a 20 millimeter for steering and 24 millimeter for digging overdrive, and I have three 25 millimeters. The second hole on these, on these 25s is at the 20 millimeter point. So, so long as these two clear on the dig and overdrive, they'll be fine. Uh, I don't want to have to resort to whatever junky plastic horns I have here. Uh, I would prefer to use those clamping horns. They work great. Anywho, um, I will get this receiver hooked up and I will get this thing under power so I can get some servo horns mounted. As is often the case, I'm gonna have to fire up ye ancient laptop to get Castle Link running. Uh, steering works. Uh, we've got some real smoothness here. But as you can see, uh, the motor is running in reverse. So I will remedy that through Castle Link, once they get the servos set up, and we have a real wiring nightmare at this point, and I'll have to dis figure out how I'm going to distribute the auxiliary channels to run overdrive and dig. But it looks like the copperhead will fit pretty nicely either here or on the other side, probably right there. Um, and. We're, we're making progress quicker than I thought. It's going together well. As is the case with fixed length drag links, I have a monstrous amount of sub trim in there. It's moving it over probably three splines just because the drag link being equal length to the Panhard link, it's, it's too long. Like, I don't know, maybe some other servo would line it up straighter, but the geometry, there's no, there's no bump steer at all. None. Like it does not move. But because I have so much trim dialed in, I can get to lock there, but I, I, can't, I can't get to full travel that way. 
I'm missing probably two or three degrees of steer angle that direction. So I'm gonna have to fiddle with, I have to make the overall length of that link, I don't know, maybe two or three millimeters shorter. Hopefully I can dial it in enough and not have the threads bottom out to still get the steering. I, I really, I don't wanna mess with this geometry. That front end geometry is perfect, but for whatever reason, that steering servo, it doesn't, it doesn't center up to these links at all. So that's just another thing to mess with. So far, so mostly good. All right, so we've got dig. It operates very smoothly. And I've got overdrive. A little clicky engaging. I can probably trim that out a little bit. Now I should be able to set this switch to three position. But uh, I'm, I'm still battling my way through that. I'm just happy that I got it, that I got this far. So now it's time to try to clean up this wiring a little bit, figure out where I'm gonna mount the receiver. I guess the speed control is gonna have to go right here. Thank God I faced the wires out this way and not this way. This is what I get for not reading ahead in the manual. I hope this clears everything it needs to clear. So I'll get this wiring tightened up. I'll get the rest of the screws put in to hold this down. Um, there are some little wire guides, but I don't know if I'm gonna have to use those as I'm only having one wire come from the back. Um, I'm gonna have to figure out how to bundle these fellas up, get that guy mounted down. And uh, at some point, make some sort of smaller tray to go above this tray to hold this little guy in place as the straps i mean they're nowhere near so that's where we're sitting for now so far everything's great we've got four-wheel drive now i have to get the ancient laptop out as i mentioned to set this thing to the opposite of whatever it's set to now and uh, we might get this thing on the rocks eventually. I was shooting for tomorrow, maybe today. We'll see. I don't know how much it will bother me, but I've gotten the overdrive servo set to the lever here. Which is pretty good. So I believe that's the low. Trying to look at that drive shaft speed. Yeah, that's the low. And that's the high overdrive. Shifts pretty smoothly between the two. I realize now that I think without a low profile servo, I don't know if I'll be able to get the interior mounted. So I'll just leave that off to the side until I can probably replace these with some low profiles as I think these 32 kilo servos are probably just ridiculous overkill. I've got an AGFRC, I think it's an SA18 and my Capra, it's, an, it's a great servo. I'll, I'll see if I can get myself to spend the money on, on two of those just for uh, overdrive and dig duties, but one down. Uh, rear still not engaged at all because uh, the servos laying over there on the bench. But uh, moving on to the next one. While trying to figure out where to put 
the electronics as that Airtronics receiver is a little bigger than some of the newer stuff. The battery also being very small and light. I remembered I had one of these Traxxas receiver boxes. I don't know what it's from, the Rally or the Stampede 4x4 something. Anyway, it's really small. It fits nicely on that side of the battery tray. If I put the little baby three cell on that side, which means I can use the strap location. I took it over and threw it on the scales and it's still almost perfect. The only wheel with more weight on it is oddly this one. The servo side is slightly lighter than the non-servo side. I guess there's more link over there less link over here so we get a little bit of weight transfer over onto that side but the rear is almost perfectly symmetrical even with the well i mean i guess this the battery doesn't really weigh very much at all so that receiver box with the receiver are really close that'd be nice because the wires will just feed in from that side right there i won't have to fabricate anything to hold that battery in place most of the wires will just jump right over uh, hopefully the interior will fit over these servos, at least over this servo, which would mean I would only have to get a low profile for here because I noticed that the, the servo is basically higher than the little shifters. So I haven't really taken a close scope of the interior, but I feel like that servo is going to get in the way and the, the wiring is probably going to potentially be an issue as well. Anywho, uh, moving on from there, I gotta stop saying anywho. That's the update for the moment. I'll get that receiver box mounted down, get that battery strapped in, get this wires cleaned up a little bit better. This, this right here is why I wish a Fusion would have fit. Um, censored brushless is a pain because you've just got wires going everywhere. I don't know how the body is going to sit and fit exactly yet. I'd like to have the switch somewhere accessible where I don't have to futz with the body. So I won't mount that yet. I'm probably going to take this extension off as it's no longer needed. It only needs to reach right there. But, uh, get some of this tightened up and then we'll get to assembling the body. It seems almost a shame to sully up this work of art with my shoddy wire routing, which, I mean, looks like a suitable nest for a rat. I'm a, some cleanup will occur in the future. No, no rig in my fleet gets wired one and done. The MST, I just threw that in there. So we've got a little nest there. Uh, Lily Yella is quite clean because there's really nothing involved. Those Hobby Wing Fusion are amazing. I wish one would have fit in here because I had the, I had the wiring pretty clean in there. So this is how it's gonna sit for now. I can almost guarantee just by looking at it that that interior isn't gonna fit unless it sits up really high. But why would it sit up really high if that little big shifter guy is down there? That thing has gotta sit way down. So I haven't really looked at how the body sits. I don't, I'm, now I don't know. I, I, don't, I genuinely don't know. I don't see how that little panel could be high enough. I mean, if that sits about there, how far do you have to get this down? Well, it's gonna fit or it isn't gonna fit. It's it's not a deal breaker by any means. I don't have interiors on any of my other vehicles. Colonel Mustard has the included interior and the head on the guy isn't even painted. So it's, inches away from being in a running condition. I gotta do the wire clean up there. I gotta install uh, one of these JST plugs so I don't have to use the 
servo balance adapter because it makes it just ridiculously long and the wiring is a big enough mess as it is. I now do worry about the not having a cover, but with the way this transmission is set up, I wouldn't even know what to begin taking out to install that cover now. I still haven't set the pinion. Uh, I don't know how good the mesh is. It sounds okay, but it's probably not perfect. Sadly, the included Vanquish strap is too long. I will have to put a shorter strap in there. It barely has any bite. The battery can just move all over the place. It's not sexy. I've definitely decreased some of the sexiness. But I, uh, I continue to have high hopes. So I'm going to keep moving forward. The masks went on well enough. I've mentioned in other videos, I'm, I'm more of a fan of the Oracle style uh, masks, mostly because they're not as sticky. These are almost too sticky. Uh, there's a spot here where it's stuck to itself and I, I couldn't get it off. Uh, they went on relatively well for someone trying to do it with ham hands. Uh, it's never going to be perfect when I'm painting a body. Uh, as long as it passes the six foot test, I'm okay. For this body, we're going 100% the dupl color vinyl and fabric from your local auto parts store. Uh, desert sand for the seats, charcoal gray for the interior, and believe it or not, this is indeed silver. It is not light gray, it is silver for the body panels. Uh, I've already started painting the seats. They went on way too thick, so, but if they crack, eh, it'll just give it a little, a little character. But I'm getting ready to paint the body. The dupli color goes on very quickly. Uh, you can do five coats in about 25 to 30 minutes. Uh, I will probably back this whole thing in black once the seats are done and the interior is done. And of course, once the body panels are done, I'll just back them all in black so it'll look nice and uniform from the inside. It might darken the color down a little bit uh, as opposed to backing it with white, but I would like to keep the layers of paint as thin as possible. So the, this guy is gonna be this guy. Uh, I, I was gonna go with a different color and then it occurred to me, I don't have any silver rigs of any kind. So, silver it is. Well, it's not that we're specifically anti-OE tire here. Uh, they just don't seem to last very long on most rigs. Uh, I have one, yeah, I have one crawler still on two, one and a half on OE tires. But they come in the kit, so I'm gonna put them together. And every rig does at least its first run on the, the kit tire. So while I'm impatiently waiting for those coats of paint to dry on the interior and the body, I'll get these put together. It's usually pretty straightforward. I never have too much issue. Uh, I haven't heard exactly rave reviews about these Vanquish tires, but I mean, they look the part, so they're gonna get built. Here we go. I, I run all tires vented, and my preferred method is the leather punch. I just do two holes, like the 12 o'clock and the 6 o'clock positions, try to get them as to center as I can, go in between those lugs. Lots of little plug if I can grab it. There we go. And we got a nice hole. We've done the same thing on the other side to do all the others. I don't know. I mean, there were complaints, but these they seem pretty soft. Uh, if anything, the foams are quite stiff, but even just kind of 
I think these are gonna break in really well. I'm surprised how narrow they are. I know the tires are narrow, but these are, those foams are maybe one inch wide. It's really gonna come down to how those beads seat into the plastic bead locks. I don't, I don't mind plastic bead locks. I think they look fine. Uh, you don't have to put a hundred tiny little screws in. So, I mean, I'm more optimistic about these than I was initially. They seem pretty okay. I mean, we won't know till it's on rocks, but so far, all right. You really kind of have to appreciate the faith put into us by Vanquish as there's 12 of these, the longer 12 mil long M2s per wheel and six of these little 256 guys per wheel. And that's how many they give you. You get 24 of these and you get 48 of these. And that's how many you need. What's left over when you're done? Nothing. Those are the nuts to to put the wheels on. There's nothing left over. They went together even more quickly than usual. This is the, the, the sort of the type of bead lock that I'm used to from times gone by with the plastic center and the metal rings, the six bolt metal rings. I think they look fine. Um, how long they'll be on there, it's impossible to say at this point, but I think they look fine. And they're definitely going to get mounted up on the rig right now to get the chassis up off the ground. And uh, I'll get back to painting and uh, reassembling or assembling the body. So it's finally up off the ground. It sits pretty good. It's got quite a lot of ground clearance, as I'd hoped. The pan is just flat. Nothing hangs down, which is great. Uh, I wasn't even paying attention to this when I was assembling it, but the, the stubs are six millimeter all the way out. And then the, the threaded portion is actually five millimeter as opposed to the four. So they use a M5 lock nut. So to accommodate that, they give you a little adapter tool to adapt the seven millimeter wrench that everybody has to an eight millimeter wrench. The problem with their wrench is it fits so tight in the hole of the wheel, I, I can't even get it in there. I think it's because there's a lip in this ring. So they intend you to bolt the adapter down and then whenever you wanna take a tire off, you remove these six bolts like, like it's a real truck. I, that's too much hassle for me. And from a previous vehicle that had eight millimeter nuts on an adapter, I have this turned down wrench that just happens to perfectly fit in there. So that's for, I think, 17 millimeter bolt on adapters. So I've had this little turned down guy for a little while. So he will come in extra handy. I do make an effort to remove uh, wheels and tires from vehicles as sparingly as possible because nylocks are only good. I mean, essentially they're rated for one application. These have been tightened down. So when they come off, they're not gonna hold like they did before. But it's just kind of a fact of life that tires have to come on and off every now and again, whether it be cleaning or broken parts or whatever. But she's a roller at this point. And I've got a little bit of paint left and then a whole lot of body assembly left. And once I get through that, I'll be able to get some shots of this thing in working order. And there's no telling if I have time to run it today. I was right, it does look good with the, with 
the silver radiator painted with some old, thick silver paint, but it went on pretty well. I think I've finished the interior. I just got to finish the, the main portions of the body and the rear fenders, let them sit and cure, uh, get everything assembled, hope that nothing falls into that spur gear. That would be great. At some point, I'll probably have the front clip apart and I can get that cover back on. But for now, it's going to sit there. Oh, I still got to I gotta shorten the, the battery lead and put that JST on. Uh, I don't see any need to record that. That's just going to go as it goes. So we are almost done. It is nearly complete and nearly ready for rocks. And when I said it was time to bust out the vintage laptop, I wasn't kidding. And that Castle Link is almost as old as my children. Uh, I think uh, ye old Acer is as old as my children. It takes about two minutes to launch Castle Link, but it's literally the only thing it gets used for. So motor, motor, that's what we need. Motor direction, reverse. Update. Should be good to go. Let me check and see if it's alive. That steering still not to full lock because I've had to dial so much sub trim in. I will, I will deal with that, whatever that entails. Getting that maybe starting the horn off to one side to the other to get it even. But the uh, overdrive works great. How about that dig? Uh, that castle motor has a weird outrunner noise at low. It does have some real low speed control though. And with the, with the big overdrive, you can really see the front wheels trying to fight the rear ones. That's a lot of overdrive. So a while to go before that paint is done and uh, much work to be done on that wiring. I haven't even pulled the soldering station out yet, but steering is set, throttle is set. Uh, I am going to recalibrate because I reversed the motor, so I might only be getting 50% forward and 100% reverse. I don't know if it knows to correct that. It probably doesn't. So that's next up on the list. And for sure, I'm going to get that soldering iron out and get those wires taken care of, throw a couple zip ties on some of these, try to get them out of the way, and hopefully have the body finished before the end of today so this thing can go out on the rocks first thing in the morning. Hopefully you can forgive me the actual running portion, the trial run of the Phoenix is going to be brief. Now let's get that underway. Coming out of the tunnel in Drybone Valley for the very first time, my VS410 Phoenix portal. And I gotta say, it is a looker. I'm happy with the, I'm happy with all the color selections that I made. I, I think it came out tremendous I, I i don't know if i could be happier with how it came out will i be happy with how it drives i'm i can almost say for sure and full transparency here what you're watching is as it happened i put the battery in and i lined it up and i drove it in for that shot for the initial view so there was no test run. This, this is the test run. Right here, this rock is the first rock I ever climbed with it. And before I forget, I must mention, where I record my voiceover is where the rigs all live. And I don't know what's going on with it. 
but the tire compound that those tires are made out of smells bizarre. Like, you can smell it outside from a distance. I'm not saying it smells terrible. I'm just saying it smells unusual. It is a very strange smell and the strongest smelling tire I've ever encountered. I've been waiting over an hour to get that out of my system. So back to the little quick shots of it running. Uh, a lot of trim work still to be done, getting the servos set just right. The steering isn't all the way there. Um, the overdrive servos endpoints aren't quite right. Dig seems to work pretty much great. Um, quick snapshot opinion. The truck drives amazing. I actually shot the footage for the next video right after I did this little quick running footage. And I'm nothing but impressed with the Phoenix. Out of the box, with no tuning done to it at all, it's, it's let's just say it's worth the money. It's really, really good. I think, I think it's needless to say that the Phoenix, who has been at least temporarily named Argentum, Latin for silver, because it is silver, uh, will be a regular addition to all upcoming Crawler Canyon events. I can't wait to get more wheel time with it, and I think it's going to be super impressive. I'm super happy with it. Uh, what's coming for it in the future? Well, I mean, time will tell. We will see. Oh, what? Oh, could it be the portal battle? Yeah, it can, and it is. And I'll take these last few seconds, uh, as per usual, to ask you to like, subscribe if you haven't, and uh, stay tuned for more Phoenix content and more Crawler Canyon content and more of my insane babbling. Thanks.